Welcome to today's webcast. Before we begin, let's quickly go over how to get the most out of this session. Your main player area consists of three windows, video, slides, and a multi-function window underneath. Each of these windows can be moved, resized, maximized, or even closed. If you'd like to return to the default layout, simply click the Restore button on the left-hand side of your screen. The multi-function window is where you'll find some helpful tabs like questions and answers, an area to download any available materials, and speaker bios. If you have any technical issues during the webcast, please submit a question through the questions and answers panel and our producers will respond to you directly. Please submit all content questions through the questions and answers panel as well. Thank you and enjoy the webcast. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a conversation on health equity. My name is Jennifer Flynn Deer, and I'm the Managing Director for Community Impact at KPMG. I'm honored to kick off this session today. At, uh, at KPMG, health equity is a real priority. Uh, in fact, our Community Impact vision is a world with equity and access to opportunity, and we have a focus on health equity and sustainable communities. So that's why I'm really thrilled we're able to address this important topic today by engaging in a conversation with three of our nonprofit collaborators who are extremely, um, they're extraordinary in this space. Um, and I'd like to thank our panelists from the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Society, and the National MS Society for taking the time to join us today. And additionally, I wanna thank my colleagues, Todd Ellis and Megan Hendry for collaborating on this web webinar. It's been, um, it's been a great pleasure. And uh, Todd and Megan are health equity leaders at KPMG and their expertise is gonna provide some great additional context about how KPMG is contributing to large scale health equity efforts. Um, and finally, I wanna thank all of you for joining today. I know everybody is busy, um, but we, we really um, need a shared commitment to health equity in order to uh, advance this important topic. So I thank you for taking the time from your busy schedules. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Megan, Managing Director at KPMG, who will serve as today's moderator. Great. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be a part of the conversation today and excited for the discussions we have planned. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm a managing director in KPMG's federal healthcare practice and spend uh, quite a bit of time focused on health equity and how it impacts our clients and more broadly our community. We have a stellar panel conversation today. So if we flip to the next slide here, I wanna briefly introduce the experts you're going to be hearing from today. We have Nisha Fredericks, the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion from the National MS Society. Gerald Johnson, Executive Vice President for Health Equity and Chief Diversity Officer for the American Health Association. And Tawana Thomas Johnson, Senior Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion at the American Cancer Society. So really looking forward to their perspective and insight. Before we dive in and hear from them, I did think it would be helpful to just spend a couple of minutes to level set on what we mean when we say health equity and why it's so important and, and how we as KPMG and Affirm uh, demonstrate our commitment to the important task of, of really moving the needle on health equity. So to start on the next slide, you'll see we have a definition of health equity. There are lots of flavors of this uh, out there and you can Google and, and see a lot of variety. But ultimately what we're talking about is the goal for health equity is that everyone, regardless of identity, ancestry, environment, ability or skin color, has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible, um, which feels lofty, but also feels completely reasonable. <laughs> so when we talk about health equity today, that's what we're really talking about is everybody's opportunity to be as healthy as possible. 
This is important, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because there's actually a significant impact uh, to disparities that exist in our healthcare. So on the next slide, you'll see just two high level numbers that we throw out here often, uh, which is an estimated uh, cost of excess medical costs of that 93 billion and 42 billion in estimated untapped productivity. And what this equates to, as I mentioned, is not just a focus on equity because it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart business decision uh, for uh, everyone who's focused in this area. So uh, the call to action is, is significant and it's now. On the next slide, um, and this will be the last one before we get into the conversation, but I did think it might be helpful to put into context how we think about and try to solve for health equity challenges here at the firm. And so we developed what we call the health equity flywheel, which is really an approach to problem solving for equity. As you can imagine, based on the definition we went over, there's not a single solution for health equity. The things that have driven inequities over time are significant, they're complicated, they're systemic, and they're historical. And so there is really no one magic silver bullet that will fix the challenges around health equity. And so what we've proposed as a firm is that we really want to think about the ways in which we go about solving for equity. So we developed the flywheel, which focuses on these three nodes, learn with, which is really about understanding the context of the equity challenge, design with, which is really about creating with the populations that we're trying to impact, and act with, which is really around ecosystem activation, recognizing that there are a lot of forces that act on people's ability to be as healthy as possible, and our most successful interventions will include all of those. So for the purposes of our conversation today, we really wanted to focus on design with, which is really about that co-creation. And what we know from the evidence is that programs and initiatives designed at equity that center the populations we're trying to impact as part of the problem solving team and really as a co-creator in those interventions are most likely to be achieved and most likely to be sustainable. So with that, let's turn to our esteemed panel guests to hear a little bit about how each of them are putting into practice some of these principles. So Tawana, I'd like to start with you and was hoping that you could kick us off by sharing an example or, or an anecdote of how you and your organization are really demonstrating this commitment to co-creation with the populations you're trying to serve. Yeah, happy to do so. And thank you so much for having us today. I think it's a great place to start because we at the American Cancer Society really believe that we work in partnership with communities and populations to address health uh, inequities. And so the co-creation part is really important to us to bring stakeholders to the table when we're designing and creating initiatives as opposed to just kind of bringing folks in on the back end, which historically a lot of organizations have done just from an execution perspective. We believe that the co-creation, the co-design piece is critical to success. And so one great example, I happen to be here at a conference with one of our external partners, the Lynx Incorporated, which is a large African-American uh, women's organization of professional women that are dedicated to friendship and service. Uh, they, as an organization, collectively deliver more than 1 million hours each year in community service. And we have been privileged to partner with them for the last several years on a program that we co-created called the Health Equity Ambassador Links Program. And that's a program where we train members of the Links Incorporated to integrate cancer risk reduction activities into their community service work. And so it's really been a wonderful opportunity for us to have a presence in communities where links are actively doing good uh, and wonderful community service and our trusted messengers. So last year, we were fortunate to train more than 2,100 members of the Links Incorporated as health equity ambassadors. And these are women who are working all across the country at the community level to deliver work around cancer prevention and early detection. I can tell you that 
Last year, we gave small grants to about 15 chapters of the Lynx Incorporated, and within a three months time frame, they were able to reach more than 450,000 individuals with cancer prevention activities and messaging. That's something that we could not do on our own, and so the partnership is absolutely critical, and we're here to celebrate that with them today at their Eastern Area Conference. Wow, incredible. And how timely that you're, you're there to celebrate in real life. And what an um, important way, I think, to solve the other capacity problem, right? It's sort of leveraging the lack of capacity in some, some communities to use the relationships that exist already to sort of carry that message forward, as you said. So just really wonderful. Gerald, can I kick it to you? Would love to hear from the Heart Association an example and, or, or anecdote, a project that embodies these, these concepts of co-creation and co-design. Yes, good morning and, and thank you for including us in this important conversation. And I'm excited about how much alignment there is between what you at KPMG are sharing around your beliefs on health equity, what the American Cancer Society is thinking about with, with MS, et cetera. And one of the things I wanted to talk about is when you think about health equity, we, we know that health and access to health care is incredibly important, but we, we think about that whole person as well. You know, your, your notion of with, that key word you use is incredibly important. We're not doing things to a community. We're not doing things for a community. We're doing things with a community or communities. And so delighted that you share that. But we also recognize that upwards of almost 80% of what goes into one's ability to live a longer, healthier life, or said a different way, life expectancy is driven by the social determinants of health. And, and for some of the folks on this, this discussion that may not be familiar with that term, social determinants of health are really the conditions in which people are born, they grow, they live, they work, and they age, and their circumstances that are often shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at the global, national, local level. So we look at it holistically. And one of the examples that we have in terms of partnering with communities around the country is we act, we've actually stood up several social impact funds. And so we are investing in communities, addressing social determinants of health. And so when you think about access to care or access to food or transportation or affordable housing or jobs and or other related services, We've invested, we've created two social impact funds that invest in organizations around the company addressing those issues. To date, we, we, we've invested in about 115 organizations addressing these kinds of issues. And what's great about it is it addresses two big social or structural issues. It addresses the structural issue of access to capital. Many entrepreneurs that are female or of color do not typically get access to venture capital funding. Most venture capital funding, in fact, about almost 90% of it does not go to women-owned and or diverse-owned entrepreneurs. And so the social impact funds that the American Heart Association are operating address that structural issue, which is incredibly important for entrepreneurs and business owners in communities addressing social determinants of health. We also have found that in doing it, we, we take an approach of we, similar to the word you use with, we, we, we open town halls, we go into different cities, we partner with the local organizations that are there, and we leverage the local grassroots feet on the street of the American Heart Association to partner to talk about the issues, what, what are the biggest issues that are there, again, whether it's food insecurity, transportation, access to, to other things that are important. We do that with them. And, and, and to date, what I'm excited to say is that in addition to investing in over 113 um, investees, we've been able to see significant movement in, in millions of people now having access to care either through technology and innovation and or mental health services. We're excited to say that millions of dollars of, of food have been purchased in neighborhoods that are food insecure. Um, there are at least 80% of the people in those neighborhoods now reporting access to healthier food that they never had before. And from an economic resiliency and poverty reduction perspective, there are over 2,000 families now living in stable housing. And in several cities where the initiative was to focus around addressing recidivism, if the state level recidivism level is around 40%, these programs, these partners that we've been partnering with are driving 6 to 7% recidivism rate, significantly lower than the national average or the state average. So we're incredibly excited to be doing things 
with communities and, and, and seeing early returns through our social impact funds. So one of the ways, one of the many ways the American Heart Association is committed to health equity. Incredible. It's, it's so, so amazing. And I think, as you say, you know, I, I think something like an 80 percent number of people's health outcomes is determined not by access to health care, but by a slew of other social determinants. So it's so exciting to hear you guys are really taking a, a systems level approach to tackle kind of all the factors that impact people's ability to be healthy. All right, Nisha. Bring us home an example from from your perspective on uh, sort of great um, evidence of co-creation, co-design, really working with those communities. Yeah, first, I want to say thank you very much for having us here today. And uh, we use Microsoft Teams and, and for our meetings. And I'm listening to both of these um, stories, and I'm just wanting to like hit the heart button and celebrate. So uh, it's really exciting to hear these stories and the impacts that we're making in people's lives. Um, so two examples that I am most proud of is the work that is invested in developing our Black and Hispanic Latinx MS Experience Summits, which are both virtual and now multi-year programs that seek to build community and shared learning experiences. But what is to be celebrated here is, again, with that design with um, thought process, right, is how the programs are developed, which is in recognition that the best people to identify their needs are the people. People living with MS are at the center of everything from content development to platform engagement and even in thinking through language needs to remove language barriers. Because one of the ways to perpetuate health inequities is to continue to communicate with people in ways they can't understand, either through language or in using medical terminology that is unclear and quite frankly intimidating. So when you take the time to communicate with people in a way that is comfortable to them, they feel seen and heard and better equipped to advocate for their own needs. But to make this a reality, the teams that work to develop these programs work directly with the communities and spend time listening to understand the type of information that is needed, how they best receive information, and who the communicators need to be to ensure authenticity and relatability. So we also take care to make sure that the people with the specific lived experience and needs we are trying to address lead the planning and design of these programs. And then our post-event program analysis leverages principles of social justice evaluation, which emphasizes furthering social justice, building relationships based on trust, and being culturally respective and responsive while investigating structural inequities. So those partnerships are successful because the design, again, is people-centered from the start and honors the experiences and the voices of the people in the communities. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, focusing, centering that patient experience, so important. I'm going to I'm going to stay with you, Nisha, if it's OK, because I think we'll, we can sort of work backwards here. So um, while you've all given us great examples of what helps make programs successful in that co-creation, we all know that that these are tough problems to tackle and and have sort of a, a sustainability of, of all their own. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about some of the biggest challenge that's that you see as you continue to work forward with a focus on equity. Yeah, sure. Well, since health equity is dependent upon many factors and causes, a challenge we faced is to identify priority areas where we can have the greatest impact. We know that there's no one size fits all solution and people's needs can be dependent upon where they live and their access to care. So partnerships with people and organizations that are embedded in the communities and that are trusted by the people that live in those communities is critical to helping us expand our reach. And establishing trust is a major challenge we can't ignore. When looking not just to be a resource of information, but also seeking to effectively engage as we are competing with people's mistrust towards the medical community in general. We are working against a long history of unethical and racially motivated health practices. And we need to acknowledge that because we are living with the results of that today. So it's important that we acknowledge the impact that racism and bias have had on health outcomes for underrepresented 
and underserved communities. And it's imperative that we have culturally sensitive workforce that treats patients like humans and not like charts and values their lived experience as evidence. And we see acknowledging this reality and acting on it as our responsibility and to listen and to be where people need us most and meet them where they are because we can't always expect them to come to us. We must be in their communities and we need our staff and volunteers to reflect the communities we seek to engage. We have to show them we know them and that they belong. And one of the ways we've done that is by acknowledging our own error and contributions to the messaging and belief that MS is only a white woman of European descent disease. We know very different today and we want and need to change that narrative so no one is held back from a diagnosis and cure by one day. So, and then that's, you know, regardless of where they live and who they are. Yeah, so and that really acknowledgement, important. such an important part of that trust, um, sort of need, need that first before you can, can move forward from there. Gerald, can, can you give us some perspective on some of the biggest challenges that you, you all continue to face as you think about, you know, either, you know, the investment programs you, you talked about in, in the first round of questions or other um, areas of emphasis where you're running into some challenging um, obstacles? Yeah, for, first of all, Nisha, I, I couldn't agree more with you around the need everywhere to establish trust. Um, that That's going to be a ongoing thing for any of us in the space because all populations matter. Having having said that, you know, our organization is committed to being champions for health equity organizationally. And so what does that mean? It means us embedding equity into everything we do. And and, and we rally around that by we've created 10 commitments. And, and for another day I can unpack those. But one of the big things that comes with that is recognizing if you're going to be a champion of something, you're going to be relentless. You're going to challenge the issues. You're going to go there. You're going to have those difficult conversations. And so one of the challenges we've had is, is really around getting our organization proficient in, in, in using the right language to talk about very difficult topics. And so we have science as our best friend. And, and we've wrote a science paper that talks about the implications of structural racism to health equity, you know, ideal health for one person or another is rooted in all of the things we've been talking about this morning, but structural racism plays a huge part in it. So how do you talk about that? And so one of the things that we've done is we've created a language guide for lack of a better word. And we've done that too in partnership with local organizations, national organizations that help us think about, are we talking about these things in the right ways? And a couple of examples of what we heard early on was some of our supporters have said, if you're going to talk about structural racism, I'm not going to support you anymore. I, I don't want to hear that from your organization. And so we've potentially lost a few supporters, both financially and their own energy. But I will also say, and I give our CEO and our board all the credit in the world, we also recognize that it was going to be a new opportunity to bring new people to the table that want to talk about this. So yes, we've lost some incredibly important and valuable supporters, donors, et cetera, but we've gained many. And, and, and along that way, we've also realized that, so how do we change the narrative around talking about these things? And so there's language, there's, there's so many ways you can talk about things. There's language that talks about the word minority. Well, minority in many ways, looking backwards is the way most research and most people talked about populations that were different. Going forward, if you think about it, wow, why not talk about that person in, in the culture that best describes them. So if they're Asian American, if they're from South Asia, let's call, let's recognize that as opposed to a minority. If, if you're gonna talk about describing conditions of people, instead of saying, you know, they're from an under underserved or vulnerable population, how about under-resourced? Because most people, if they had the right resources, would be able to take care of and to address their own issues. And so language matters like that. We also talked about how when we talk about conditions of people, we often say these these are examples, you know, Native Americans often smoke two times, three times more than and Latino Hispanic Americans are, are overweight to X percentage and or African Americans tend to be the highest representatives of, of diabetes and or high blood pressure. 
another way of thinking about language and why language matters and why we created the language guide is, is to reframe that. That says that as a result of living in conditions that are less than desirable, Asian Americans smoke higher than and or African Americans because of living in neighborhoods where they have a higher tendency of A, B, or C, putting, putting the framing around the condition as opposed to describing someone as the condition is incredibly important. And then probably lastly, the thing that we wanna make sure that we continue to do is make sure that we're, we're sharing these language guides with others. And so we've gotten tremendous uptake from, from small, medium, and large companies. We partner with AP on Style Guide to make sure that the language is constantly fluid. But the biggest issue we've learned in addition to the things that you've heard from Nisha and you're probably gonna hear from the other speakers is the importance of language, words matter, and evolving words and language to more aptly describe the conditions of people as opposed to describing a person by the issue that they have is a big opportunity and we're spending a lot of time addressing that. Yeah, fantastic. And I'll just say, um, I think one of the more inspiring things we've been seeing lately on this focus of equity is organizations like the American Heart Association sort of living their values and, and walking the walk. And so to your point, sure, that might mean that everybody doesn't want to walk along with you. But I think it's just been incredibly inspiring to hear those types of stories where it's it's really sort of a an ownership of the values that that we talk about being important. So just wanted to highlight that always an, an inspirational moment. Tawana, let's let's go back to you in terms of, of the biggest challenges uh, that you all face as you continue to try to move the needle on equity. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question because we love to talk about the, the successes and, and I think we really have to unpack some of the challenges and opportunities so that we can better serve our communities. And I think what Nisha and Gerald have shared very much resonates with us in, in terms of the approaches that we've taken as an organization and working with organizations in ways that build trust and credibility and really involve them, as we said earlier, in the co-creation of initiatives. The other piece, so when I think about this, I think about the, the challenges um, through two different uh, lenses, the internal lens, which a lot of times for us has been around just a lack of literacy in our organization, right? So we are an organization of more than 3,000 staff. We're supported by 1.5 million volunteers. And when we decided as an organization that we wanted to use your words, walk the walk and really center health equity. That meant that we had a lot of internal work that needed to happen from, you know, training of staff and volunteers around uh, health inequities and structural racism, creating resources and tools to enable uh, culturally appropriate and tailored support and engagement with communities. We had a lot of conversations and did a lot of work around uh, language Language, such as the American Heart Association. We also created an inclusive language guide. And we recognize that as we were building the internal capabilities of our organization, that that needed to happen at all levels of the organization, including our board. And so we spent time uh, briefing our board on structural racism as a public health issue. And that was really important. Those were important conversations for us to have. And we're very fortunate that we have a, a CEO who very much believes that uh, health equity has to be at the nexus of everything we do. We have four pillars as an organization and health equity is not a pillar because we believe it's it's foundational. It's cross-cutting. It impacts everything we do as an organization. And so a lot of work has gone into building resources and, and staff and volunteer literacy to actually work in the health equity space. The other piece that I think is, is a real challenge, and Nisha touched on this, it's, it's really around the workforce, right? The external workforce, the healthcare workforce. For us, obviously, the oncology workforce is incredibly important. And we know that there's just a lack of diversity uh, in the healthcare space that is concerning to us as an organization. You know, I I can give you, you know, just one quick data point about 5% of all physicians are African Americans, 5%, but yet African Americans are about 14% of the US population. And so we've made a real commitment to ensuring that we are diversifying not only the oncology workforce, but the overall healthcare workforce. 
we invested $16 million in the four HBCU medical schools because we know that the HBCU medical schools and other minority serving institutes are opportunities, engagement with them are opportunities for us to prepare the next generation of physicians and physician scientists. We launched a new internship program focused on underrepresented uh, students in the sciences, really looking at how do we create a pipeline of students of color that can help shape where we go in terms of finding new discoveries, new interventions, new therapeutics that will help us end cancer as we know it for everyone. So we've been very intentional about, you know, addressing both the internal opportunities slash challenges, as well as some of the external uh, challenges. And I have to say, I think the workforce one is something that we all have to be really, really focused on because we know that when uh, patients of color and other groups that have been historically marginalized, have experiences with healthcare providers that look like them, that understand their experiences and their backgrounds, they're better outcomes. They engage with the system in ways that are more productive and lead to better health outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an encouraging um, sort of piece of the of the puzzle that we see more and more is that that connection to the lived experience of the people who are serving uh, the populations that we're trying to target. So we are short on time here for the rest of the panel discussion. So I'm going to wrap us up, but I, I did want to just spend one last minute saying that, you know, when KPMG set out to put together our health equity flywheel and our overall approach, we also wanted to walk the walk. And one of the things we did was listen to organizations and people like our panelists uh, who have been on the front lines doing this work for a very long time and, and sort of take our pointers from the experts. And so um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's good resonation with sort of our, our with approach, that collaborative engagement with the communities that we need to serve. And again, Tawana, Gerald, Nisha, just want to thank you uh, so much for your time, your inspirational stories. Um, what a what a great um, way to sort of break, break up a middle of a day with, with some of these really inspiring takes on, on how we can help continue to move the needle. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass off the mic here to uh, my esteemed colleague, Todd Ellis, to uh, give us a, a sneak peek into sort of the future of health equity, where things are moving, and, and maybe if I can be so optimistic, sort of things we should be excited about as we move forward. So Todd, over to you. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks uh, to the panelists. Uh, every time I hear this topic, I get excited and it builds even more passion in me uh, to do more uh, in the health equity space. So what I really want to talk about now is health equity 2.0, the future of health equity. As you heard, you know, social determinants of health are so important and they will continue to be important political determinants of health. You know, a lot of times you look at policies and how policies, while might be well intended, sometimes it has a negative impact on these communities that we're talking about, the under-resourced. But I want to talk a little bit about where we're headed with regards to health equity. Again, not saying that social determinants of health and political determinants of health are going to go away. They're not. But when you look at where we are with innovations, technology, how we use data, genomics, AI, machine learning, the digital world, these will all have a major impact on the under-resourced. And the point as I go through my slides, I want you to think about a couple of things. Technology can be great. Innovations can be amazing. But the technologies, the innovations, the AI, the machine learning, we got to make sure that it's fair, it's applicable to all communities. Because if not, if you look at the cost that we're absorbing when it comes to health inequality, those are going to skyrocket. And I like to think that if we don't put health equity at the foundation of everything we do going forward with advanced technologies and innovations, that number is going to go higher and there's going to be a gap. There's going to be a gap with the haves and the have-nots. And we just got to have at the core 
of these new technologies health equity so that we do not create technologies and innovations for a select few. Next slide. All right, not a one size fits all model. The esteemed panel, they talked about this. I like to call it the 88%. Do we know what the 88% is? The 88% is, you know, when you look at clinical trials, things of that nature, the 88% represents, you know, those trials really being focused in on people of European descent. That is a fact. It goes back to the point of we got to get under-resourced communities involved in clinical trials. We can no longer afford to only look at a certain segment, the 88%, because by 2045, the minority will be the majority. Think about that. The minority will be the majority. And if we don't start laying the groundwork now for health equity, again, it's going to be it's going to be a gap. We're going to look like a third world country, the haves and the have nots. And I'm going to keep saying that because that could be a reality. So when you start thinking about you could go ahead and go to the next slide. But when you start thinking about the genomics, the AI machine learning, I was just on a call this morning with a major academic medical center on the West Coast. And we started talking about the algorithms, the machine learning, how they use data. And how do you make sure that those algorithms are not biased, right? When you talk about a diverse workforce, a diverse clinical staff who has input into these algorithms, into the AI, into the chat GPT, you want a diverse group of individuals looking at that. You just don't want one segment looking at how do we build this algorithm, because if you do that, it's going to be biased. If you look at the slide that I have up in front of you, I want you to notice a couple of things. Yes, I put a, a, a picture of the future to the right. Remember what I said, the minority will be the majority by 2045. That's so critical. Normally, if you look at the demographics, again, we looked at the 88%. That's going to change. It has to change. Because when you look at many different populations. I got to stress again, one of the panelists said that this, we have to be in the communities. We have to be in the communities. We have to understand what's going on in those communities. Another thing that I want to acknowledge, we talk about biomed that goes back to genomics, things of that nature. Currently, there are very little, if no biomed companies that reside in communities that are under-resourced. That has to change. In order to build that factor of trust, you have to put those biomed companies in the communities in which they're trying to serve. That's so, so important. So I think and I hope that we're gonna see a, a shift in that because it's so needed. So when you look at this picture, the dynamic of this picture will change. Precision medicine will impact health equity. Really understanding what is needed at the individual level with regards to pharmaceuticals, because again, we do know certain pharmaceuticals do not fare well or ineffective in certain communities. We know that for a fact. So those are the things we have to change. And more importantly, when we talk about the digital age, bringing care to communities where they live, where they reside, that is so important. And that is the future. Next slide, please. All right. I like to say, you know, a shift towards consumerism with health equity. I call it basic humanity. Uh, I'm going to give you a little analogy. We all, you know, we all live in homes or apartments. It really doesn't matter. But where you live, think about this. Frame it as a house. Frame the U.S. as a house. And when you go in your house, you want your house to be neat, properly put together, etc. 
But what happens if there's one room that's unkept, dirty, you don't want anybody to see? Normally, you're going to go clean that up, right? But we got to take that same approach and methodology to all of our communities, right? When you look in your city, where you're at, and you know there's a certain segment that is under-resourced, don't close the door. Let's go in and clean that up from a health equity perspective, because that's where your mind should be, right? You want to make sure the whole house is clean. You want to make sure the whole house is kept. Um, and that's so, so important. But as you look at these, I like to call them in the middle, right? Uh, these will impact what I call, again, the gap. Everything that you do from a, in the future from a healthcare perspective, when it talks about meeting the consumer's evolving demands, commit to value the outcomes. Foster care through layered delivery network, but also convenience through technology disruption. We know that technology will advance and will continue to advance. But as you look at your organizations, especially the healthcare organizations, I would ask of you to look at these four items that we just talked about and say, well, how are we addressing these four not for the 88%, but for every community in which we serve. And you should have a strategic plan on how you do this and how that's gonna impact health equity. That's what I would encourage you as leaders in your organizations to drive that change, right? Every strategic plan that you have, every particular no matter how detailed it is in your strategic plan, how does health equity play into that? It has to be at the core. It's not a one time, we got to take care of it in one or two years because health equity, health inequity is not going to go away within one or two years. This is a decades long type of issue. It's a global issue, but it should be within the fabric of your organization because if not, I'm gonna keep bringing it up, you will see a gap, right? The haves and the haves nots. We know for a fact that if we don't start looking at this in more detail, embedding it into our, everything that we do as an organization, the numbers are gonna skyrocket, the costs are gonna skyrocket, and these under-resourced communities will continue to struggle. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna. This slide kind of reiterates a little bit of what I just talked about. Again, basic humanity. Where the healthcare industry is going, and it's all based on the consumer. And as you look at each one of these layers, as you look at each one of these boxes, I would, I would, I would ask you to think about your organization. And if your organization are talking about these particular topics, focus on innovation, connected healthcare industry, right? Prioritizing the consumer experience. What does that mean for you? Do you have a strategy around each one of these bullet points for all of the communities in which you serve? Now, again, I would encourage you to look at each one of these bullet points and say, when we think about the future of healthcare, how are we addressing each one of these from a health equity perspective and not just you know, a particular segment of your community? And also I would say too, <clears throat> this is, like I said, this is, this is tough. This will, this will take a, a total shift of thinking within your organization, not only at the C-suite, but throughout your organization. And you have, you're going to have to be committed to it. The one item that I do have a star beside, if you see it says access to personalized care leading to greater health outcomes. 
again, that goes back to genomics. This is a very, a very hot topic right now, genomics. I think this will continue to be a very hot topic, but I also think genomics, if done correctly, if really understanding the human genome in specific communities, I think it will have a great impact on health equity. So you're going to hear more and more about this, but again, as you start to looking at genomics, let's make sure we have to hold ourselves accountable that we are doing this for the right reason. We're not doing it for a certain segment of the population. We got to put the dollars aside and make sure again that we are doing this for the right reason. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I, okay, I had to put this in here because to look at these pictures, especially probably three of them. I mean, this equates to a third world. I mean, this could be a third world country. But these are pictures from within the U.S., all four are pictures from within the U.S. The point I'm making is this. Let's put health equity at the foundation of everything that we do. Let's make sure that our house is clean. Let's make sure that we look at all communities and it's fair, because if not, this could be the reality for years to come. And I always like to say that, you know, nobody should be like this within the U.S. They shouldn't. This reminds me of a third world country that haves and the haves not. And my personal commitment that which drives me every day is what I put down here. I know that I would not solve health equity in my lifetime, but I would go forward every day as if I can, no matter how naive the thought. We all have accountability to erase this burden for those without a voice and without the means to change the system that we've created for the privileged. And let me qualify my statement when I say the privileged. I'm privileged, right? I'm not going to sit here and say I'm not. I'm privileged. We're all privileged. But we owe it. We owe it to ourselves to drive that change because we have the privilege to do so. So as you look at the, at the future of health equity and where we're going, very promising, very promising. But also let's not forget the work that we have to continue to do with regards to social determinants of health, political determinants of health, et cetera, to bring it all together so we can drive meaningful change. Now I do wanna take roughly two to three minutes to talk about a couple of things that we're doing. If you can go to the next slide, <clears throat> Some very, some very unique, you can go to the next slide. Some very unique things as we as KPMG and how we partner with uh, organizations to drive health, health equity. Uh, the Lake Nona Impact Forum, a very unique uh, forum that's held in Orlando at Lake Nona, uh, where we actually bring together some of the top thinkers in the world when it comes to changing the healthcare system. This is something that we're committed to. We do this every year. And again, the beauty of the Lake Nona Impact Forum is not the panels, you know, it, it's, it's not the speakers. The beauty of the Lake Nona Impact Forum is bringing individuals together at a global level and sitting down and talking about how we can partner because all too often you go to conferences you listen to the panelists you walk away and nothing is done but this is really more about collaboration bringing together unique individuals coming together projects and then next year when we are at the lake known impact forum again we talk about what we were able to accomplish uh, as a collective so i would encourage you again uh, we do this every year. It's a great event, but it shows our commitment to others within the industry uh, on how we're going to change health inequalities for all. Next slide. One, one thing that we are having uh, in the fall of 2023 uh, is a global health equity symposium. Uh, this will be named after uh, Dr. Satcher, who was a Surgeon General under the Clinton administration. 
So we'll be sending out a save the date. But the focus of this Global Health Equity Symposium will be, you know, bring into the audience startups, innovations when it comes to health equity, but also bringing together thought leaders in this particular field to drive meaningful change. Just like I said for the Lake Nona Impact Forum, it's not just about a one day event. It's about bringing people together where they can really start working on some projects that will particularly help uh, you know, these under-resourced communities that we're talking about. So a save the date will be sent out. Uh, we will have to cap the event <laughs> because again, we're, we're anticipating a great demand and registration for this event. One other slide, please go to the next one. Morehouse School of Medicine. We've been working with Morehouse School of Medicine for about three years now. And, you know, we had the honor and privilege through HHS Office of Minority Health to build the first ever digital front door for under-resourced communities. And what's very unique about this platform is we use data. We use real live data that's updated on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. We have claims data, but really the beauty behind this platform is these under-resourced communities can actually use this platform, type in their zip code and really understand what healthcare related assets are available to them. That could be uh, uh, clinics, that could be pharmacies, that could be where can you go to get a vaccine, et cetera. And now we're expanding the platform to talk about certain disease states, diabetes, hypertension, cancer screenings. Uh, another, another quality of this platform is this was built with community-based organizations. This was not a platform, like was said earlier, that we built this and you did not have a seat at the table. But at the core of this platform are over 200 community-based organizations throughout the United States, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, but also researchers. So we were able to bring together research, research, researchers, excuse me, community-based organizations, and some of the leading, the leading thought experts in health equity to provide this platform and asset to those under-resourced communities who need it most. So I'm very proud of this. I'm very proud of our partnership with Morehouse School of Medicine in moving the needle uh, in health equity. And again, I'm going to end it here. I have a couple of more slides, but I know time is of the essence. But I'm so proud of where we are. We still got a long way to go. But with the panelists that you heard from, with our commitment, with your commitment, you know what? I am very, very optimistic. And I'm going to be naive to say that we will see meaningful change in health equity in my lifetime. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Todd. We were originally planning on having time for a Q&A, but we are short on time here and we want to be respectful of everyone's schedule. So we just want to say thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our KPMG speakers. Thank you to Jen Flynn from the Community Impact Team for introducing herself at the beginning of the call. There will be a follow-up email to everyone who tuned in today where you can follow up with questions to Todd or Megan or any of our panelists. So keep an eye out for that email and we hope you'll join us again for another important KPMG conversation in the near future. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful day.